I'm going to take a moment just to kind of walk you through the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. It is one of my favorite modernist poems, but it can be really challenging because Eliot's not easy. He doesn't make it easy on purpose. Um, Eliot was highly educated and made no bones about the fact that he didn't care whether you understood or not. He had his own project, um, and that was really all that concerned him. So I want to take you through the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock because it's one of the most important American modernist poems. Um, I want you to see kind of how he is addressing earlier poets that you probably are not seeing because you, you need kind of a, a larger sense of, of poetry in order to see some of these illusions that are not necessarily isolated here in the, um, the Norton Anthology. And also to show just how he's addressing the issue of the modernist man. Um, so let's take a look and I'm going to kind of go through this pretty quickly. So definitely feel free to pause this whenever you need to pause this video to take notes, to mark your own book up. Um, this is what we would kind of be doing in a class in person if, if this wasn't an asynchronous class. So let's begin. This is the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock and right away the title tells us it's a love song. We are expecting romance. That's what a love song is. Why would we expect anything else? So the title is ultimately, as you know, going to be ironic. Um, and just as a heads up, it's going to be much easier if you've already read this poem. So if you haven't, go ahead and pause this video, read the poem through. Don't worry about understanding it, but at least then you're not going to be encountering any of this for the first time. So if you've read the poem, you know this is ironic. J. Alfred Prufrock doesn't get anywhere. Right. If this is all about finding himself a lady, he is has no game at all. So the title is ironic. And right away, that should tell you something about modernist man. Right. The modernist man is unable to do much of anything, especially in the realms of love. So let's take a look at this head note, this epigraph, this, uh, si io credessi che mio risposta foste a persona che mai tornasse al mondo. This is Dante, right? And our footnote, it's really important that we read it. It tells us that the speaker Guido de Montefeltro is consumed in flames as punishment for lying. And the thing is, in Dante's Inferno, he says this, this little piece of Italian here, he says this because he doesn't think Dante is going to get back to the real world. He is going to confess his sins and say everything because Dante is going to burn with him, right? What he doesn't know is Dante actually does make it back to the real world. So we have this kind of juxtaposition between one of the most famous poems in all of the Western canon, Dante's Inferno, which basically established Italian as a language, and Prufrock. Um, that should tell us that then when Prufrock says, let us go then, you and I, the fact that he is specifically addressing the reader as the you, it, it's making that similarity, that analogy to Guido de Montefeltro, also making his um, confession. So in part, Prufrock is going to tell us everything that he tells us in this poem because he thinks that we're in hell with him. Right. So whether we are or not doesn't matter, but just he has this view of the world. So let us take a look. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious in argument of insidious intent. So right here, we get the sense already that if there was any rhythm or rhyme in this, um, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient right here, etherized upon a table, the whole rhythm, it breaks down. It won't let us have that sing-song poeticness, right? It, it constantly feels rough, kind of, and disjointed. Um, read this poem out loud. You're really going to see that it won't let you just have pretty poetry. And it says to lead you to an overwhelming question. And this is our whole conceit of the poem. Um, J. Alfred Prufrock wants to ask a question, but he says, oh, oh no, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. So he's not even going to ask the question, which is the whole point of the poem. And we're going to come back to this idea of the question, because if you don't understand what the question is, you're not going to understand the poem. But let us take a look a little farther. 
So we have a stanza break, and he talks about, in the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And then another stanza break, and we get the yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening. So the juxtaposition of these two stanzas tells us that he's imagining the room where women come and go talking of Michelangelo. He's imagining a museum where he might be checking out the women, right? But he hasn't actually gone there because what we have in this next stanza, the yellow fog, is a cat. This is um, kind of a, a very imagistic representation of a cat, which is using metaphor in order to kind of draw the city inward. But he's inside the window pane. He hasn't he hasn't left. Lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys. Slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. So again, we have two random paragraphs about a cat. So he's thinking about leaving, and then his mind comes back to a cat. And again, I want you to think about this kind of like modernist aesthetic of fragmentation that the unity is constantly broken up here, but it's also replicating consciousness. If you think about you're sitting there trying to get yourself ready to go do something that you don't really want to do, that you're a little nervous about doing, your mind's going to wander. And his, J. Alfred Prufrock, not T.S. Eliot, but Prufrock's mind wanders to the cat that has like now curled up and fallen asleep. And then he says, and indeed there will be time. Now here... We have an echo of Andrew Marvel's to his coy mistress, had we but world enough and time. Now, if you didn't look this poem up, I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to look it up for you. Um, to his coy mistress is, let me pull it up in a way that you can actually see it. Um, to his coy mistress is a poem um, that is basically saying, look, we're all going to die pretty soon. You're not getting any younger we might as well get it on, right? He's saying, and it's a great poem because it's very poetic, but he's basically saying like, look lady, you gotta give up your virginity to me because if you don't, look, your beauty is not gonna last past death. And that long preserved virginity and your honor is gonna turn to dust. And your grave's a fine place, but like if you die before we have sex, like what's the point? It's worms that are gonna take your virginity. So to his coy mistress, the fact that this um, particular J. Alfred Prufrock is saying, and indeed there will be time, is an echo of had we but world enough in time. In, his to, in, in the poem to his coy mistress, the speaker of this poem is saying, we don't have time. You can't wait. Your beauty is going to fade. You're going to end up as worm food, and so am I. So let's get going here. That is a huge, huge difference than Prufrock, who's saying, there's plenty of time. We don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to rush and do this. It's a really big difference between those, those two speakers. So we have um, the smoke on the window pane. It slides along the street. It rubs its back upon the window panes. There will be time. There will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. Prufrock is going to keep saying, there will be time, there will be time. He is going to delay, delay, delay. He does not have agency. He is ineffective, right? He, he feels broken and isolated, so he's not even going to go out of his house. He says, there will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days. And again, it gives you this alliteration to this Greek poet Hesiod from the 8th century, Eliot is writing back to these other poets that lift and drop a question on your plate, time for you and time for me and time for yet a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of toast and tea. We got time. We don't even need to go have tea yet. And then he thinks about the museum again. It's this echo of in the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. Like if he could just get out to the museum, he could see women. He could maybe pick one up, but he's still in his house. He's still just thinking about it. And then we get again, there will be time. So again, it's that echoing back to Andrew Marvel, but also saying, ah, I'm not ready yet. 
to wonder, do I dare? Do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. So this idea of do I dare disturb the universe, again, is really an echo of to his coy mistress, which is about um, changing, right? Making this change, making this giant decision. In this paragraph, we get just how kind of um, lack of confidence that Prufrock has. He's afraid to do anything. He's afraid that the women will say, look, he has thin hair. Look, he's thin and skinny and weak. Um, and then there's a shift, right? He said, there's time, there's time, there's time. And then we get to this pair, this stanza where he talks about, for I've known them on our, all already, known them all. I have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? So again, we have another allusion to traditional literature, but he's making excuses now. And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? So in this, he's moved from thinking he's going to go when we have this image of sprawling on a pin and wriggling on the wall, it's this image of like an insect pinned, right, for examination. He talks about, and how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted in white and bare, but in a lamplight downed with the light hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And how should I presume and how should I begin? So he, he vacillates back and forth between, I've known women, it's fine, right? They're not even that pretty. Look, all those white arms, they actually are hairy, right? He's making excuses. And then you get another shift. Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. So take a look at how this particular stanza is broken up. Grammatically, it is one sentence. Shall I say, I have gone out of dust through narrow streets and watched the pipe smoke that rises, watch the smoke from pipes that rises from lonely men in shirt sleeves. But because of the way it's broken up, it almost feels like there's something else going on. And then it shifts again. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of a silent seas. So basically, he would have rather been a, a crab, like the ultimate bottom feeder, than any of the things that he's going to do now. And then he's going to make more excuses. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ice, have the strength to force the moment to his crisis? So basically, he's wondering, like, look, even if we go out, even if we have tea, when it's all done, am I even going to be able to ask the question? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, so here he's turning himself into John the Baptist or Jesus, right? These are biblical illusions of suffering. Though I have seen my head brought in upon a platter, again, John the Baptist, I am no prophet and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. So Prufrock is so pathetic that even death laughs at him. Like, even death thinks he's ridiculous. And he says, and would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it toward some overwhelming question. And here we are back to the beginning, if you remember, back to the question that he doesn't ask at first. This question is tied directly to his coy mistress, which is at the end, where it says, let us roll all of our sweetness up into one ball and tear our pleasures with rough strife. 
So in to his coy mistress, he's saying, look, let's the world in a ball is this metaphor for, well, let's get it on, lady. That's the question. That is all Proof Rock wants is to go out and make a connection and possibly have sex with some lady. And he can't do it. He says, would have been worth it to say, I am Lazarus, come back from the dead, come back to tell you. I shall tell you if one settling a pillow by her head should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor and this and so much more? And then he says, it's impossible to say just what I mean, which is funny because he's said a whole lot of stuff up until here. But, is, but as if a magic lantern through the nerves in a patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or show, throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all? So in these lines, he wonders, look, so I go out with a lady, we go to tea, I ask her, hey, you want to come back to my place? And she comes back and then she comes and she takes off her shawl and she's like, wait, no, that's, that's not what I meant. Like, we're in the front zone here, guy, right? He's worried about that. He's worried about this rejection. And he says, no, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a saying or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool, differential, glad to be of use, poetic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. At times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. And again, all Shakespearean references, all traditional literature. He says he's almost the fool. And that's really important because in Shakespeare, the fool is actually usually the smartest person in the entire room. But he's not the fool. He's almost the fool. He says, I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? So like comb over. Do I dare to eat a peach? And that is 100% as sexual as you think it is. I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have mer heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think they will sing to me. And this, I think, is one of my favorite lines because it totally just underlines how completely pathetic Proof Rock is. Sirens, mermaids, they literally sing to every man and bring him down to his death. And he is so pathetic. He is so unsure of himself that he doesn't even think that monsters will come after him to kill him. Right? I have seen them, the mermaids, riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the white water and black. So again, listen to how the fragmentation of that sentence works. It trips you up. And that's part of the kind of stylistics of Eliot. But it's also really tied into this kind of modernist idea of fragmentation and not letting the reader have an easy time of it, right? Making the experience of the poem and the interaction and perception of the poem part of the meaning. He says, we, so again, we're back to that we, and that's important because it goes back to our epigraph, right? Let us go then you and I when the evening is spread out. It goes back to this idea that in Dante's Inferno, people talk to him because they don't think that he can escape. So when it says, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. He's including you, the reader, into this, right? He's saying, even you are part of this. You are like me. And so part of what the poem is doing, part of what the love song of T.L. for Prufrock is doing, is really making us consider, is this our truth? Is this our meaning? Are we as ineffectual? Are we as scared and as meager as proof rock is? Are we trapped in modernity, trapped in a city that has museums and prostitutes and all sorts of other fun things that you can go out and experience women and connection and we are stuck inside with a cat? Although the cat leaves, right? The cat goes off and explores and we're still stuck inside, right? So when we think about Eliot and we think about the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, it's definitely a challenging poem. It's, it's, it's hard to just approach it without any kind of help um, and explication. But it really, really helps if you understand that he is writing specifically back to the Andrew Marvell poem to his coy mistress. Because in this romantic poem, the speaker of this poem has no qualms about using every bad pickup line of his time period to talk some poor girl between the sheets. 
But proof rock is so isolated, so kind of alienated from himself and from his world that he doesn't even leave his house. He doesn't even try. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope it kind of explicates one of the poems. I'm really interested to see what um, some of you have to say about the poem. Um, if you want to work on this one, The Hollow Man pairs with this very well. It's another statement of kind of modernity and what it has turned humanity into. Super fun stuff. Super happy. By that, I'm totally kidding. Okay, let me know if you have any questions.